Okay, folks. Today I thought I might give a little more detailed insight into um, the mechanics of the whole 19 and later Tundra transmission cooler uh, debate, if you want to call it, debacle, the missing transmission cooler saga, and uh, some insight as to what hardware we're adding and what functionality that provides versus what the factory has deemed necessary or unnecessary or whatever. So right now we're looking at side of the transmission, okay? This is my 21 Tundra. It has, uh, it's a TRD Pro, it has no external cooler. So what we're looking at right here, right now is the warmer. As evidenced by the fact that I ran it for a minute and a half getting it on the lift from the garage. These lines are warm because they come from pre-thermostat block circulated coolant at the engine. The purpose of which, this is a plate type heat exchanger. There's transmission fluid through half of it. The other half of the passages are coolant from the engine. Um, and the engine comes up to temp much faster due to internal combustion than those of the transmission fluid, which only warms from friction and uh, shear forces in the torque converter, which are not much until you put it under load. So to get it up to op temp at the transmission as quickly as possible, we want to exchange preheated coolant to the in, to the transmission fluid to warm it to operating temperature so you don't have sluggish shifting on cold mornings, etc. So that's why that's there. Okay, but in the past, there was another device sandwiched in here that gave an external path for the transmission fluid, and it had a thermostatic function. It was a thermostat valve, literally, uh, that was there to determine when to open that passage. When you hit about 190 degrees or so, it allowed coolant to flow to the front of the vehicle, up here in front of the radiator area, to an external cooler, which was a fluid to air cooler, that allowed air, ambient air temperature, which is much lower than your engine coolant temperatures at that point, to bring the temps of the transmission fluid being circulated to it down or regulate them to keep them at a steady 195-ish, okay, which is optimal operating temperature, 190-ish. Uh, all right, so I was going to show you the differences. Currently, the plate that's there that allows fluid flow into and out of the preheater, which sits here, that round device I showed you with the coolant hoses going to it. Here's your in, inlet and return path from the transmission. There's O-rings that go right here. This came off my 19 that I'd already put the uh, cooler system on, the thermostat on. Then the, uh, the other device, the warmer, has O-rings captured on it that sandwich here. It bolts on there. Okay, so that sits there. This is the new part, okay? This is the missing part now, but if you look at a diagram for 07 through uh, 19, or through 18, 57 Tundras, even 47 or 46 Tundras, a lot of them, uh, with the six speed, they have this device, which allows the warmer to sit here, but also provides an external coolant flow, or transmission fluid flow path right here, okay? Outlet, return. This is your thermostat. It has a pin in it right now propping the thermostatic spool valve open. Uh, and that is so that you can go ahead and purge the air out of the uh, external cooler. And if you want to change the fluid, you prop that open. But as you can see, the back sides of these devices are the same. Okay. Same interface. This allows coolant or the transmission fluid in and out. In and out of the warmer. When this is closed, it only has that path. Okay. When this opens that path is usurped by this path, which allows uh, coolant or transmission fluid, I don't know why I can't say training fluid, flow to the external cooler at the front and back to the transmission. Now the warmer's always in effect, unless there's some sort of thermostatic control uh, going on up front that I'm not aware of, but as far as I know, it's in the heater valve circuit. Um, so anytime the engine is running, coolant is being interfaced here. <clears throat> engine coolant, but the capacity for that front mounted cooler to shed heat is much greater than 
the capacity for that to put it in. And that should be about op temp at that point. So if you're introducing heat in the form of friction and load and shear forces through the transmission's work uh, when towing, etc., uh, that are greater enough or great enough to raise in uh, transmission fluid temperatures above what the engine coolant temp op temp is, this opens up and allows that flow path and regulates and keeps that temperature down at operating temperatures. Okay, that is missing from this. Clearly, there is no thermostat and no external flow path. So, in case you had any doubts, I'll show you where that goes. But uh, that's the device you have to swap out in order to gain the thermostat function or the uh, external cooler functionality once you mount one up front. Because there is no external coolant, no external transmission fluid flow path without this device on this transmission, period. Uh, the only place is here, and obviously that is not convenient. You would have to remove the warmer to use these paths, and you'd have to have an O-ring faced interface like this sandwich interface, which isn't going to work out for aftermarket install. So you need these hoses. These are 3 8 or um, 10 millimeter type hose. So real simple. So I'll show you some more here in a minute. All right. So a little more detail. So there's the, the warmer we're talking about. Here is the sandwich plate without the thermostat that I was referring to. So there are three bolts, one there, one, two here. Okay. That sandwich, the plate, warmer to the transmission. So they're rather long. Um, they look to be 12 millimeter. In my head, I had them as a 10 millimeter. Obviously, I had forgotten. I'm on my messy toolbox here. It's been a minute since I've had a chance to organize. So we are going to crack these loose. And you're going to lose a minimal amount of fluid doing this. Um, maybe half a cup which is really inconsequential i know there's fluid level nazis that will say oh my god you don't have it exactly at the factory fill level well guess what this sump is somewhere between four and six quarts uh it's not gonna notice your missing cup it really isn't now if you want to fill it up fine replace what you lost i get it there's a fill hole uh, you can do that if you deem it necessary. This is your fill level check. This is your drain. Um, I forget where the fill hole is. There it is. Uh, that is the fill plug way up there. That big guy. So have fun with that. But uh, you can also pre-fill your lines. Pre-fill your cooler if you want to. It probably would be wise. That probably holds a half a quart. Something like that. Of added capacity. That's not there now, so that will be taken from the sump if you don't uh, allow for that. So, something to consider. But, you know, this will come right off of here. Here in a minute, it'll break loose and you'll see a little fluid dribble dribble. Sorry for the crappy quality. I'm self filming today with an iPhone. I don't have better means. I don't do this for a living. I'm just doing this as a service for those of you who are interested in preserving the longevity of your investment in the form of a $60,000 truck in this case that Toyota decided in all their engineering wisdom after 12 years of production run having deemed a, an external cooler a necessary item and having used that as advertising fodder about why their truck was better than others, they decided all of a sudden, oh, well, you know what? Maybe it doesn't need a transmission cooler. Mind you, it's the same transmission, same engine, same chassis, same fluid. I know everybody has conjecture about what they think the differences are, but they're wrong. Um, they just decided uh, the bean counters had a little bit to say about where they had to... Uh, Rob from Peter to pay Paul in order to get you, you know, adaptive cruise control and predictive um, collision avoidance and Apple CarPlay, you know, all the things that matter when you're towing. Um, so, you know, 7,500 bucks worth of uh, hardware when you make 980,000 trucks a year, it adds up. 
that's in the millions. Do the math. I'm no professor, but anywhere you can skimp, you can add it somewhere else, right? Keep the price where you need it to be. Stay competitive. Most people wouldn't notice. Who toes with a tundra? I mean, come on. That's for rednecks. Well, they took away the gauge, so what do you care? Right? So long as the little blinky light doesn't come on, everything's fine. So that is fluid at 10,000 miles on this 21. I have not done much towing with this. Flatbed trailer with a car occasionally, or a mower, ATV, but uh, not the camper, really. I've towed it to and from the dealership 10 miles away a couple times, but not enough to really get things warmed up. So it is in good shape. I'm not going to change the fluid today. I'm just going to uh, top it up with a little Valvoline Max Life ATF, which is perfectly compatible with Toyota WS. In fact, it is a arguably much higher quality oil. Um, well, this last bolt is a little bit tricky to get your thumbs around, but not too bad. So you can see we're losing a tiny bit, just what was sitting there in that interface, but it's not much. It is not much, so we'll get this the rest of the way threaded out. That little plate's going to fall out of there, because I've got one hand to do everything. So, there we go. I'll just let that fall. Dutta. Nice, clean fluid. Keep your three bolts handy. You're going to need those again. As the new plate is no thicker than the old plate, you really don't have to worry about different bolts. But there's your O-rings hanging out still on the tranny. We're going to remove those because our new thermostat plate comes with them captured in it. So don't forget to take those off or you will have double O-rings and you will be in a world of squirt and hurt. So leave these O-rings. You do need those. Make sure you do not damage them. Um, and that you wipe that surface off before you bolt it back up or you'll be smelling tranny fluid. You're going to want to wipe this off. Don't spray anything up there. You don't want to get any foreign material or fluids in your transmission, which is now open to the elements. So don't mind my dirty garage. Like I said, I barely have time to do the work I need to do, much less go back and reorganize. But I will take some time over spring break and do that, hopefully. So that's going to drip a little bit because it holds a little fluid in there. Um, but don't worry about that. Just, it'll quit in a minute. So once it does, then you can roll your drip tray out of the way. I know not everybody has a lift. I get it. It's a luxury. I'm bougie. Um, it is very helpful. However, you got plenty of clearance under one of these. If you got some ramps, drive it up on it. You can lay under here and do this with just regular drip tray and you're not going to get all nasty. Okay. So right here is evidence left over of where the cooler lines that ran to the front used to go. This was the routing bracket where they ran right here. And there was a little clip that went over top of that. So they didn't change that. They just took away the cooler. Sweet. All right, so we're gonna bolt that back up with our new one right here. Make sure you don't have any foreign matter. <laughs> Blow it out. Don't want any shipping junk getting in there. All right, this is going to be tricky. Don't know if I can do this and show you guys at the same time. I doubt it. So we're going to take a break. Okay, folks, I have buttoned up the install here of uh, the thermostat plate. And it is really hard to see from under here. Anyway, you can see it up there. There's the thermostat. You can see I've installed my hoses. Um, I'm using Parker 801 push lock hose. It is for uh, fluids and fuels that are petroleum based. Um, I think it's like 280 degrees and below. It's tough as nails, folks. I mean, I've been selling that stuff for 15 years. I work for a Parker distributor and it is incredibly tough stuff. So abrasion resistant, weather resistant, doesn't get hard, brittle. Uh, it is industrial grade hose, okay? As you can see, I've used this bracket that was here, the guide bracket, and I've tilted it back this way a little bit and then canted it up to get the edge to lead, you know, with the hose routing so it's not 
pinching or a biting edge um, and that works out good and then i've zip tied my hoses around it um, so they're good and secure i've got them routed under the oil pan just sitting you know kind of run under and through i don't know if i'll be able to get this to show it's dark in there they're black hoses but runs around this trans or this front axle mount and then through and back up to the front so there's nothing sharp or anything these are all rounded that's a rounded point and then it's just sitting between the chassis and my trd skid plate i'm assuming you could do the same with the standard stock skid plate um, but that protects them they're not going to get snagged on anything when i'm wheeling not going to get hit by any branches um, but uh, that's a fairly simple way to route them and uh, if you ever need to service them, worst case, you can drop your skid plate and you can get at them. But uh, it's nice and secure up there. So I'm going to go ahead and start it with my remote start here with the thermostat propped open to make sure we don't have any drips. So I'll do that now. Well, maybe I will. I may be too close to it. I'm underneath it, so let's try not being underneath it and see if it likes that. Hmm. Well, for some reason, it's not wanting to remote start. I don't know why. Okay. So, from the top, I have already installed the grill earlier before I decided to make this video. But uh, you can see my cooler assembly in there. I've got it mounted to the plate below it. It's a black steel plate. Got some AN6 to, or AN10 to AN6. It comes with AN6, or AN10, or JIC10, however you want to say it, uh, male fittings. And I put reducers on there to six, and then crimped number six, 90s which is a 3 8 90 to a 3 8 hose there. It's hard to see, sorry. But that puts it in a really nice spot. Lots of airflow. I trimmed this air dam back here a little bit, you know, the black air dam, just to allow for where I wanted to mount it. Won't affect airflow um, critically at all. And then down here, I don't know if you can see, you can see my hoses come out right underneath that air dam and then go down over the sway bar um, and then down between the, skid plate and pans so pretty simple should be out of harm's way down there and uh, keep things cool so i'm gonna start her up it wouldn't start before because my hood was up and uh, it didn't like that okay so now i've got her on the lift up and running just checking for leaks and uh i don't see any nice and dry Pardon my shaky hands, squatting down, holding with one hand. But no drips, I checked up front, no drips up there. Everything looks great. Now, the next thing to do is to go ahead and, now that we've confirmed there's no drips, you can see that pin. Let's see, zoom in here. See the pin in the end of the thermostat. Yeah, well, does not want to focus on that. There it is. You need to pull that dude out of there. Boom, and you see the thermostat pop close. So it will open on its own once it reaches an operating temp that requires it. But uh, save that little guy, because the paper clip's not strong enough to hold it all the way open. Uh, so when you want to change fluid later, now that you have an external fluid path, the way to do it is just exchange fluid at the cooler by propping open this thermostat and uh, pumping two quarts out with the tranny shutting it off, pushing two clean quarts back in with a pressure vessel or whatever method you devise. But that uh, gets rid of dropping the pan and all that kind of stuff unnecessarily to do 30,000 or 60,000 mile intervals, whatever you deem necessary. So save that little guy, he's handy, and you can put him in with a nice pair of long needle nose. So highly recommend you save that. Uh, I don't know where I'm gonna stick it, but 